Hey guys, today I'm going to be making a video on how to solve the ace-king-queen game, also known as coon poker. This was a game that was invented by an American mathematician in the 1950s. It's a well-studied game, and it actually maps directly to this week's GTO Brain Teaser that involved looking at a three-card version of Blind Man's Bluff. If you want to understand that mapping, check out our blog post, I'll link to it. In this video, I'm just going to focus on how you solve the ace-king-queen game, because I know a lot of people had trouble with that. So I'm going to restate the problem here. There's a three-card deck with one ace, king, and queen. Both players are dealt a single card, and they have to pay a $50 ante. And there's one round of limit betting, a $75 bet with no raises. So if you play poker, you know what that means. And if a bet is called or both players check, then we go to a showdown and the high card wins. So the question is, what is the GTO strategy pair for this game? And what is the EV of the game for each player? So the approach we're going to take to solve this is we're going to try and simplify the game and look at a simpler game that we can analyze more in depth. And then we'll step backwards and see what we can use from our solution to the simplified game. So we're going to assume that player one always checks. We're going to solve that game. And then we're going to step backwards and verify, given what happens when he always checks, should he check or not. And this is kind of the game theory equivalent of guess and check your answer. It's easy to check if something is Nash equilibrium even though they're hard to find. So we're going to assume that always checking is part of an equilibrium, figure out what you do if that was the case, propose an equilibrium, and then check it. And in this case, I know that always checking for player one is part of an equilibrium strategy. But even if you didn't know that, this can be a really good approach to start unraveling a bigger problem. Because when you go and verify to see if player one always would check, if you find out that he shouldn't, that's going to teach you a lot about the game, give you a lot of intuition, and you're actually going to have to end up doing math very similar to what we're going to do to solve that more complicated case. So how do we go about solving the simplified game where player one always checks? The first step is just to use some basic intuition to eliminate dominated strategies. I'm going to use the term dominated slightly loosely here and just kind of use common sense to say things we should never do. So clearly no player should ever fold an ace to a bet. They have the nuts. They call, they'll always win. Similarly, no player should ever call a bet with a queen. They have the Indian, so they call, they'll always lose. And given those above two statements, betting a king is weakly dominated. If we bet a king, they're never calling with worse. They're never folding better. And with limit betting, that makes betting a king just a bad idea. With no limit betting, there's actually still reasons you might bet a king. And the mathematics of poker covers that. It's definitely worth checking out. And the last observation we can make here is that checking an ace is weakly dominated. If they're always going to fold, checking and betting ace are the same EV. But on the off chance they might call, you might as well bet it. So let's apply those to figuring out the rest of the strategies. If we avoid these dominated strategies, we can actually reduce the game to two decisions. For player two, the only question is, how often do you bet a queen? You're always betting your ace. You're never betting your king. And for player one, it's just how often do you call with a king? Remember, you're checking to start with. You're always calling with your ace. You're never calling your queen. So first, let's rule out pure strategies for these two options. If we were always to call with a king, then player two will never bluff, and they'll just value bet their ace at us. If we were to never call with a king, player two would always bluff a queen at us. And for player two, if he were to never bluff with a queen, player one would never call with a king when we bet our ace and we get no value. And if we were to always bluff a queen, it's actually not obvious that that's a bad idea. It turns out it is, and we'll verify that at the end as part of our equilibrium check. So now we get into the heart of the math of this problem. How do we actually solve for PQ and PK? So to actually work this out, we're going to apply indifference conditions. And if you don't know what those are, go back and watch our previous video on rock, paper, scissors. I go through it in depth there. But the basic idea is we write out the EV of betting a queen. We win 50 chips when they fold. Here, PC is the probably they call. So they fold 1 minus PC of the time. And we lose our ante plus the 75 that we bet for 125 when they call, because a queen always loses. And if we check back a queen, we just always lose our ante, because we always lose at showdown, so we lose 50. And difference conditions require these two are equal. So if you set them equal, do a little algebra, you get that for betting a queen and checking a queen to be equal EV, they need to be calling exactly 4 sevenths of the time. And since they're always calling with an ace, and they have an ace half the time, then they need to call with a king 1 7th of the time, because 
50% of 1 plus 50% of 1 7th is 4 7th. So next step is to figure out how often player 2 should bluff with a queen. And again, we just apply indifference conditions. They should bluff enough to make the EV of calling and the EV of folding equal. So the EV of calling is losing 125 when they have an ace. That's going to happen with frequency 1 divided by 1 plus PQ. 1 plus PQ is the total frequency of bluffing. That's 100% of the time with the ace plus PQ percent of the time with the queen. And then they're going to gain 125 when the opponent is bluffing with a queen. So that's PQ over 1 plus PQ is how often that happens. So if we set those equal, do algebra, we get that PQ should be 3 sevenths. So that gets us to the point where we can now actually guess an equilibrium and check it. So we've assumed player 1 should always check. Are we right? So up until now, we haven't actually proposed a full strategy for both players. We've only proposed what they do when player 1 checks. An equilibrium requires a full strategy for both players, so it has to specify what player 2 would do were player 1 to bet. So we're going to assume our equilibrium full strategy is that player 1 always checks. After a check, they both play according to the PQ and PK that we solved for. And if player 1 bets, player 2 calls, always with an ace, PK with a king, and never with a queen. And all we need to say is, is there a profitable deviation for either player? So let's check that. Verifying that equilibrium is really easy compared to finding them. We've already solved all of player 2's decisions. We know he can't deviate because he has no action in the first round. So we just need to make sure that player 1 can't profit by betting without checking. So can he increase his profit by betting with an ace? The answer is no, because his opponent is calling with probability PK, that's 1 over 7. Whereas when he checks, his opponent is bluffing with probability PQ, which was 3 over 7. So he's getting value from a worse hand, 3 sevenths when he checks, versus 1 seventh when he bets. Clearly he shouldn't bet an ace. Can he bet a king? We already ruled out betting a king for either player as a bad idea. Can he bet a queen? Can he profit by bluffing? Well, player... 2 is calling with the exact frequency we figured out uh, for PK, such that betting a queen and checking a queen are equal EV. When he checks a queen, he's always losing. So betting a queen is no better than checking a queen to him, so he can't increase his profit by betting a queen. And that's actually all we need to do. We now know we have an equilibrium because we get to treat the other player's strategy as fixed. We just need to say, can a player in isolation deviate in profit? So the last step is to get the expected value of the game. And this is really just a number crunch. All we do is we look at each hand matchup, and we see if they play according to the equilibrium strategy, what is the EV? So if player 1 has an ace, player 2 has a king, it goes check, check, player 1 wins the ante. Player 1 has an ace, player 2 has a queen, uh, player 1 checks, sometimes player 2 bluffs, sometimes they don't. We do math, and we can just work this out for each case. And now we've got six equally likely cases. We add them up, we divide by six, and we get the EV of the game. And it turns out that the in-position player is going to profit by 1.786 per hand. This, All these equations were written from the perspective of the out-of-position player. So our final step here is to check if player two can deviate by bluffing all the time as a pure strategy. That was the one thing we skipped. <clears throat> so... If we look at the bullets above, the second and the fourth one are when he has a queen. And if you add those up and divide by two, you get an EV of 50. And remember, that's from player one's perspective. So on average, player two is losing 50 chips when he has a queen. And if we imagine him always bluffing, when our opponent has an ace, he'll always lose 125 when he gets called. And if our opponent has a king, he's going to fold six out of seven. Again, I'm writing these from player one's perspective. So player one will lose 50. And player 1 will call 1 out of 7 and gain 125. And so the player 1 EVs are 125 when he has an ace, 25 when he has a king. If we add those together and divide by 2, we get 50, which is the exact same average. So player 2 cannot profit by deviating to a pure strategy. And that's actually all we need to do to complete the answer to this question. As usual, if you guys want to check out more of our brain teasers and our game theory content, definitely check out our blog. You can follow us on Twitter. We tweet pretty much every time we post something. And subscribe on YouTube to get email notifications when I put out a new video. 
Thanks for watching.